everybody. Uh, welcome to the first live Inside Opera in uh, just over two years. It's wonderful to see actual people. And at the same time, isn't it wonderful to be in our new home? And uh, there's been quite an extensive amount of renovation. Kim just took me upstairs to what will be, I guess, the choir room, where they'll be able to have some rehearsals. They'll be able to do some warming up and lounging around. Uh, a great deal has happened to our building, and we're really, really thrilled with all of these new developments. And we're here today to talk about the double feature by composer Lee Hoiby. And I thought I'd begin by telling you a few things about Lee. Um, he actually, uh, a, a, an American composer, uh, mentored by and influenced by Giancarlo Minotti. Um, and so he's in that vein of writing operas that are actually friendly to the audience, even though they were composed during the 20th century. And uh, some of his successes include uh, an operatic setting of Tennessee Williams' Summer and Smoke. Um, however, for us in Victoria, uh, he gave us, or we presented his setting uh, on which he collaborated with his partner, Mark Schulgasser, of Shakespeare's The Tempest, and we produced it in 2004. It remains one of my own personal favorites amongst Pacific Opera's offerings. And uh, Lee came up to, to see it, both Lee and Mark did. And I'll tell you, we did a, a, a lobby lecture, as we always do at the Royal Theater. And uh, so imagine how it felt when sitting right in the front row when I was talking about The Tempest was the composer Lee Hoiby and the librettist Mark Schulgasser. Um, it was very nice to find out that they were extremely friendly people and Lee really loved our production. He spoke to the audience a little bit himself and he was only going to come and see it once, but Timothy told me he changed his flight plans just so he could see it three times. So he enjoyed it very much. And uh, he actually also spoke to his management and said, that he would like to have the recording that is sent out to prospective companies who are interested in it, he'd like to have it changed from Santa Fe Opera to Pacific Opera Victoria. Oh, wow. This was kind of a coup, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, Lee died uh, in 2011, but not before he wrote another opera, a setting of Romeo and Juliet, that Timothy keeps talking about doing, so who knows, we might do it. One of the things that endeared uh, Lee to me very, very much is that he's also a diehard, long-time, serious Joni Mitchell fan which I like. And his love of, uh, of words comes through, I think, in all of the works that he's produced. Uh, he first wanted to be a concert pianist, and then he went into composing. And one of the uh, things that he does out or did outside of opera that was very successful is writing songs. And one of his champions um, was the great American soprano Leontine Price who introduced a great many of his songs to American audiences. So he has that in common with a number of other American composers, including, of course, the partner of Giancarlo Menotti, Samuel Barber, a love of poetry and the potential it has to create this new art form. Uh, and the only other name that I would mention among Lee Hoiby's great um, influences is that of Franz Schubert. And I imagine anybody who writes art song is going to be attracted to the songs of Franz Schubert. So it was quite a thrill for all of us to imagine putting together this little show of two one actors. Now, do you all have your tickets, A or B? Have you seen the show already? The Italian lesson and... A and B. A and B, okay. <laughs> because we've just been told that it's virtually sold out for the whole run and has been for a few days, which is kind of nice actually, and I think you'll find it really exciting to be in this space. You'll see this set inhabited by the one and only Megan Latham. Latham. I just, I'll, I'll call her just Megan. And <laughs> she's been one, she's like part of our family. And so we'll talk about her a little bit later. But in, just to give you a tiny little sort of taste of Lee Hoiby's musical idiom, I'd like to turn to our principal coach and master accompanist and great two-fisted orchestra, Kimberly Ann Bartzak, who's going to say a few words and give a demonstration of the piano. I love that he calls me that, and I, he gets away with it. Two-fisted or orchestra, I feel that's, that's so powerful. And Yes, <laughs> embrace that power. Exactly, Kimberly I will. Um, so I'm just going to kind of slowly walk to the piano. Um, I, so like Robert was saying, Lee Hoiby was a virtuosic pianist, and you can really hear it in all of these performances, I am the orchestra, but I actually wanted to draw your attention in the Bon Appetit music. Uh, so if you have seen it already, you'll uh, remember there's a few spots that our Julia Child is mixing very, very vigorously this batter, and she has a competition. I apologize if I'm making any spoilers. Um, she has a competition with the 
uh, the KitchenAid blending machine. And in the music, you can hear it really, really well. In our production, we actually have the machine going on at the same time, and there's three different speeds. But if you didn't have it, and if you really listened to the piano very, very carefully, he actually incorporates it into the piano part. So this is the first speed. Um, this is when you're just mixing the egg yolks. For the cook enthusiasts, enthusiasts in the room, um, when you mix egg yolk, it's very, very easy to blend. You know, there's no, not really much any clumps or any lumps. So in the piano part, it's very chromatic. So it's just going from one note to the next and it's very, very minuscule. And it's very, very, we'll call it simple. So a nice low but quick speed. And it goes like this. So it's very, very, you know, <laughs> petite, cute. Now, the medium speed is when we start having a little bit of the clumps. So in the piano, what he does is he has a little bit of the chromaticism, which is going from one tiny note, but then he also incorporates huge leaps. So it's almost as if the blender is kind of like doing that little kick that's going from like, oh, it's got a little bit of a lump or it's, you know, catching. So you can really hear that in the right hand of the piano. Again, a very, very short excerpt. So. Very, very small kind of chromaticism, but again with big, big, big leaps. But then we get to the third speed, which is the highest speed, in which you're really, really kind of putting it all together. And what Li Hui Bi does is he has the left hand playing eighth notes, so very, very straight. The right hand plays triplets, so you kind of have this two against three pattern that's going against each other. Um, so this is how it sounds. And you can hear that swirl going and it kind of just gets a little bit stuck and then it kind of just breaks it all apart. And if we didn't have the blender going, you would hear all of that in the piano part. The blender gets really, really loud, so it gets almost like this chaotic <laughs> feeling in the kitchen. But then wouldn't it be the best way to have a kitchen show if there is chaos in it? Or wouldn't there be great chaos? <laughs> um, so yeah, so these are kind of just little, little snippets. In the Italian lesson, uh, what Li Huibi does is actually, instead of making it very pianistic, he chooses very, very different colors for which character he wants to choose. So we have the maid, we have the husband that she might not be so happy to be talking to on the phone. It's, and it's very like, oh, oh hello, dear. Um, so we have very, very different colors. And what's really great is instead of it being with the orchestra, with the piano, I can really, really bring out those colors because it's just not as thick it, as it would, would be in Bon Appetit. So I can really, really bring out these different feelings that um, our Mrs. Clancy is feeling uh, in the show. So yeah, so these are just little sneak peeks of how I get to bring the orchestra out of the piano. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, while Kim is getting uh, relocated, I'd like to take a little bit about two extraordinary women. The first one is Julia Child herself, who inspired Bon Appetit. And I'm imagining that just about everyone in the room has seen that performance of Meryl Streep in that mm -hmm. movie. I'm, I, I'm one of those people, I remember Meryl Streep and almost nothing about the sort of parallel story that went on. Um, and. I just wanted to share this little anecdote with you. I have some friends of mine who live in Arlington, Massachusetts, went to school in Harvard, and Julia Child used to live there in, in that area. So she would go do her, her shopping when she wasn't on one of her tours, and she drove. Now remember, Julia Child was a pretty 
tall woman. She was an ample-sized woman. She drove a little uh, raspberry-colored Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> and in those days in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, so did 90% of the rest of the population. And so Julia Child would uh, tied a, a wooden spoon to her aerial so she could find her car more easily when she <laughs> went back into the parking lot. I just thought that was wonderful. Um, and the other thing I'll share with you about Julia Child, Timothy told me that she would do these tours. She was invited to all the cities. And of course, every city that hosted Julia Child would want to show off their best restaurant and their finest lunch uh, venue and things. So the last day of her tour before she was to fly home, someone said, now, what, where would you like to go to have lunch today? What, what are you in the mood for? And she said, oh, I'd like a couple of those wonderful Costco hot dogs. <laughs> They're pretty good. They are, actually. <laughs> they are pretty good. Um, and then uh, the other extraordinary woman is the person for whom the Italian lesson was first composed, who is none other than Edith Bunker herself, Jean oh. Stapleton. Um, Jean Stapleton, I think people don't always realize, had a very distinguished and long career on the stage. Um, and, of course, she's well known to us for her numerous TV movies uh, appearances as well as All in the Family. But we're never going to really equate somebody writing an opera for the person who sang that song with Carol O'Connor at the, at beginning, the beginning of All in the Family. <laughs> uh, but Jean Stapleton actually was a very versatile performer. And um, it's wonderful to think of this great American music theater opera composer finding exactly the right tone to both portray one character and to write for another so, Kim, you first did this when it was filmed. Yeah. So can you just tell a little bit, share a bit with the audience, the difference between preparing something? Live music <laughs> cannot compare to anything else. It is, oh, it felt so nice to be able to have our um, in-person premiere on Friday in front of a live audience. Um, just the idea of being able to work around, like, I don't even know how to explain it. It's just, it's so invigorating. There's, you know, you never know when little things can happen or Megan can, feels in a certain mood in a certain moment. You can really just kind of enjoy it. Whereas in a recording, it's just kind of one way, one tempo, um, and it, it doesn't change from there on out. The, the thing also that we had done is, and I'm not sure if all of you know this, but when we did the recording last year, we did the audio recording first, and then we did the video recording after. So Megan actually was very limited to the certain choices that she had made in the audio recording, the certain time that she needed between you know, a gasp and then coming into a next, a next line. It had all been predetermined in our audio recording, and she had to replicate that perfectly when we did the video recording. So it kind of just, you lose that spontaneity, you lose that vibrancy, uh, from, from live performance. So when we got to do it last week, it, was, it just felt so alive. And we actually, we were able to kind of play off on each other a lot, which was really, really fun. Um, you know, with a live audience, things, live performances, there's always things that kind of come up that you don't expect to. The, the cake almost fell down, which wasn't really the plan. And she ended up ad-libbing on the spot. And she's like, oh, well, let's kind of fix this. And, and like that's, that's the enjoyment of live theater. You can really get to enjoy those beautiful moments. And that's actually not inauthentic, is it? I, most no. of us who remember that uh, episode in Julia Child's TV show where she, a, 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 a lamb roast that she was about to put in the oven, she dropped on the floor and she just yeah. picked it yeah. up and said, <laughs> it's a five second rule. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> Now, when you mention that, I'm going to actually uh, bring, bring to play, bring, invite another celebrated name in the theater, Dame Maggie Smith. I just read an interview with her, and this, I think, illustrates how difficult it is to just play to your pre-recorded mm -hmm. recording. She said she's never watched Downton Abbey because she would just sit there the whole time saying, what in God's name possessed me to do it like that? <laughs> so here's Megan having to do exactly, yeah. and you yeah. having to basically. Well, and, um, and also what's really interesting is in, in, in the Italian lesson, um, Lee Hoiby actually specifically says to follow very, very much what Ruth Draper, because it's actually based on, on her performance, uh, on her, her version of it. And it's, it's very much of a mixture of singing and speaking and half spoken, half recit. So it's, there's so much mixture in it that in a live performance, Megan can really feel, 
you know, how is the audience engaging? How is, you know, what are the reactions that she's getting? And she can play around with that. Whereas in a pre-recorded version, it's kind of, okay, this is what it's going to be set no matter what. And sometimes it could fall flat and sometimes it can work really well. But in a, in a live setting, you can really just play around with it, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, we've learned a lot about that. And Joey, you have too. <laughs> You guys are doing such a great job. Oh, no, 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 no. No, we have to bring you into this. Um, I, I, again, I'm going to add a little bit of a, a personal anecdote. Last month was the 30th anniversary of Joey and I meeting each other. I've known Joey Pietroia for more than half his life. And it's been, and it's been wonderful to, know, to be yes, friends with you that whole time. Um, so we won't dwell on this a great deal, but Joey stepped in more or less at the last minute into this project last year because of Timothy's mm -hmm. unfortunate... Uh, personal experience. Mm -hmm. um, so what was that like? You, you always help Timothy out anyway, don't you? Well, you always... I, I, part of my job is to be sort of around as the assistant conductor and helping and giving, out, giving notes and um, uh, it just happened. And sometimes I'll have to take over a rehearsal. You know, Timothy may have to go to a meeting or do something and say, hey, can you just step in for a minute? Uh, but yes, I had to take over at the last minute. It, 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 Timothy had done all the rehearsals uh, with Kim, all the staging rehearsals. And it was just, uh, I think, the day before a f or two days before orchestra the first read. orchestra read. And, uh, and uh, I had to step in and then take over from there into the recording. Um, and I'm glad that uh, you know, I was able to help out and do it. Uh, it's just part of the, part of the job. Um, so coming in, I had to be uh, aware of what, um, had, what Timothy had rehearsed up to, up, up to that point and how he and Megan had worked things out and the pacing so that I could just basically step in and not, um, you know, turn it on its head or anything, but just continue that, that track. Uh, so, so that was, that was quite, quite an experience. But um, I, again, I'm glad I was able to help and, and see it through till the end. Yeah, but, and you had a whole orchestra. Well, it's not a large orchestra. It's a, though. It's a chamber yeah. ensemble. So it was um, a string quartet uh, with, so, two violins, viola, cello, and then um, a flute, an oboe, a clarinet, a bassoon, and a horn. So a sort of single winds. But it was still back in the time of, of... Oh, and piano, of course. <laughs> <laughs> there is piano in there, and piano, yes. Uh, so um, it, uh, it was still in the spring, so we were still deep in COVID. So the, the COVID protocols were still in place. So. I was probably where that table is there. The string quartet was sort of in front of me because we had to be distanced. And then the wind players were basically, the piano was here. Oh, and a harp, there was a harp as well. Mm -hmm. Piano harp were here and the winds were basically there and near the door. So quite spread out because we had to be because of COVID. Did you have and Megan have was in the little screen? box. <laughs> and Megan was in a box, in a, screen, in, in a plexiglass box basically here. Um, so talk about restricted and uh, not being able to interact. So, but Megan is such a, a, a great uh, artist that she, in the recording, because she had done all the staging, in the recording she tried to time things the same way she had in, in the staging and bring out all the little nuances, even while she was recording. You could see in her head she was thinking about her staging. And, uh, so, and that helped out once we got to, to the recording, to the actual video. And you might ask, well, why did you record it first and then videotape it later. And the, the reason for that is that when you're recording or when you're videotaping, you have the option of doing multiple angles. So you can set a camera and do a scene and then say, okay, let's move the cameras here and now do the scene from this side so that when you're doing a post-production, halfway through the phrase, you might want to switch from this angle to that angle. But in order to make that really consistent, you have to have the recording for Megan to sing over all the time. So it's always the same, because if we were to, to say, okay, let's do it again with this angle, and now it would not work because the timing might be a little bit different. So that's why you have to have a track, a, an audio track to play off of. Um, but, uh, you know, as I said, Megan is such a, 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 an artist that mm -hmm. she really mm -hmm. did bring it all to the recording. That's great. And uh, also, uh, Tracy Dahl, I don't know if anybody came to the little presentation we did about the Garden of Alice. Tracy Dahl said that it's uh, even more difficult, even more challenging than doing a, a, a run on, in an opera. She said there was not one relaxing time. 
when she went back to her, her hotel, she was doing probably what, what Megan was doing, thinking of, of recreating all her staging elements in her imagination so as to make the, the recording work. Um, so, Joey, you also, of course, have, rec have, have conducted many of our operas live. Mm -hmm. So would you say more or less the same thing as Kim about oh, the absolutely. experience? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, as a conductor, too, you, you like to have that um, interaction with the singers on stage. The orchestra likes to have that interaction. And there is that always a little bit of, uh, of again, the, the reaction of the audience. There could be a timing thing. It could be just a, in that moment something, you know, a crescendo swells a little bit more than normal because you can feel the singer is, is really feeling that phrase and, and feels great about it and wants to just stretch a little bit so you can go with that and you play off the audience. So uh, when it's just boop, 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 it just, it, it, there, there is something that, that's missing. And it's that, you know, we're an opera company. And we're not, we're not a film company. No. So we had to learn quickly about how to, and, and Glynis, and I'm sure you'll mention Glynis and, and our stage director, has had, you know, it was a big learning curve to understand film. And, and, and we like to interact with the audience. We like to have that. And with our, with our um, uh, singers and artists, and Kim and Megan are interacting all the time in this performance. Because as Kim said, there's always a little bit of, you know, there might be, you have to wait for audience uh, reaction. Mm -hmm. A laugh, a, a laugh, so, oh, there's a, which you don't get. And for those of you who haven't seen it or did see the, the video, not to take anything away from the video, but there are a few people who said, you know, I didn't really laugh at the Italian lesson when I watched the video. I didn't think it was that super funny. But when they saw it on the preview, they were like, oh my God, that was such a great show. Mm -hmm. It was so funny. Again, it's because you're having that immediate reaction to what uh, Megan is doing and you're seeing her, phys uh, her, her facial expressions and how she's also playing to the audience a bit and their reaction. So. And speaking of Megan, we should just mention, uh, she's had quite a long association with our company. The first... Uh, Production she was involved with I, was that was 2010 I think the handle um, mm, yeah, um, Rodalinda and before uh, we actually presented that piece we got a bunch of our cast members together to sing I don't know whose idea this was we went to the atrium on Yates and Blanchard and there was a nice gourmet dinner served and our singers entertained the audience with a collection of songs by Cole Porter which has less to do with handle even than it seems on the surface uh, but. <laughs> Megan sang the song about the oyster. Oh, the tale um, of the oyster. Yeah, the tale of the oyster. And she was so hilarious. It's, if, if, in case you don't know that song, it's an oyster that has pretensions above its station and wants to uh, hang around in high society. And so the oyster gets served to a lady from high society, but then she experiences a little bit of turbulence herself, and so she throws the oyster back up again. And the oyster finds he's quite happy just to go back to Oyster Bay and hang out with his pals. He's, he's had his fill of high society, and high society has had its fill of him. Uh, and she, just, she made that into a little sort of one-woman, four-minute opera. So she's been with us several times since. Uh, I think probably most notably in her triple whammy um, uh, success in Il Tritico, when she mm -hmm. played very memorably three completely different roles in the three operas. Perhaps most, memory, uh, most memorably uh, La Principessa, and which she was just fantastic. So we're really thrilled to have her doing this, and she's been incredibly helpful and with us all the time, 100% of the way. Uh, so, it, Joey, I have to ask you this question, because I made an assumption, and I probably shouldn't have. Are you conducting this one with the piano? No, so uh, because it's just piano and and uh, and Megan, um, it's it's easy for them to just interact. And because of the way the piano is set up, if I were to stand mm. there, Kim wouldn't really be able to see me. And the, so it's much easier in this particular um, situation in this cabaret setting too to have. However, I was there at the rehearsals to help out and give out notes, um, music notes for Kim mm. and and Megan, and maybe working out the spots that uh, where Kim would have to wait for Megan or Megan might have to take it from Kim and because there's no conductor to kind of start things off sometimes in a particular section. But again, in the intimacy of this, in this space, uh, Megan might give a breath and then, you know, Kim Kim's knows, always gonna catch Kim it. knows yeah. and yeah. then they go. So it's very seamless and, and I was basically just, I got to watch them work. <laughs> I got to, uh, no, but I, I, I helped out in that sense, gave them some notes for balance, and, and uh, so I was here as a, as a uh, sort of support. 
but I didn't have, I'm not actually conducting Good. Version. Yeah, so, so it is a, a real tour de force collaboration mm -hmm. between yep. the pianist and the singer actor. So it's, I think, incredibly worth seeing. And I, we would be remiss if we allowed this opportunity to pass without mentioning the upcoming production of Don Giovanni. Uh, or as the choristers in the production we did in 19, what was it, 1999, 1998, yeah. one of those two, mm -hmm. they affectionately referred to it as Donnie G, which has been <laughs> called by us ever since. So Donnie G is coming to the Royal Theatre. And um, Kim, you'll be in the pit playing the rest of the teams, yep. I'm assuming. Excellent. Yep. So it's going to be our first. Now, what better opera than one of Mozart's supreme masterpieces to welcome us back to live operatic performance in the Royal Theatre? So uh, everybody's looking forward to that very much. There will be lobby lectures um, about an hour or so before the, the performance begins. And we'll have an inside opera for you as well. So please look forward to that. Stellar cast. Um, it's going to be, I think, super. And that is pretty much all we have to say, unless either of you two would like to tell any interesting anecdotes from your childhood. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about our first meeting, Robert. No, <laughs> it was a masked ball. It was we a masked there. ball, that's right. And <laughs> Joey was there because Timothy had a conflict in out east, so you basically conducted the first week of staging rehearsals. That's right. It was my first time. I was still a student. Oh, I, I, yeah, I was still a student. I was in my last year at McGill, and Timothy said, okay, do you want to go, you're going to go to Pacific Opera for the first week of staging rehearsals, and uh, don't worry, Robert's there, he's great, he'll see you through, and I had never done anything like this. So here I am thrown into a major opera company with these huge singers singing Big Verity, and I walk in, and uh, I thought, what am I got myself into? And I remember Robert being so so good. And Timothy said, you know, it's just staging, so you don't have to really have to do much. He said, you can stay close to Robert. And so I literally put a chair next to the piano <laughs> like this, and I was conducting like this. And then one of the singers said, um, can you maybe get in the stand in the center so we can see you? And I thought, oh, God. Maybe. So that was my first, yeah, you know, I was so, like, I just don't want to get, I just don't want to be in the way. I don't want anyone to see me. That's right. But so, Robert was great, and we had a great time. We had a really, we had a fun time. It, yeah. it was great. But, um, and Kim. I uh, just want to mention, you've been part of uh, the Vancouver Young Artists Program and yeah. the Calgary one? Uh, well, I was a young artist at Vancouver for three, well, for two and a half years, and then I was on staff. And then I was the resident conductor mm. at Calgary Opera for three years before coming here in September of 2020 during the pandemic. What timing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so uh, I, I remember meeting you at, in Vancouver when Suzanne Rigdon and I did a recital. That's when I first met you. Yes, that's, that's true. Back to, yeah, and it just, it seems like quite a long time ago, but I guess it isn't. But this, this pandemic has sort of felt like two weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's exactly yeah. when it was. And this pandemic wow. feels like it was two weeks long and also two centuries. Yeah. It's yeah. the weirdest thing. <laughs> anyway. Fingers crossed that it's over, that we don't have another wave to prevent us from, to, from bringing Donnie G to life right in front of your very eyes. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon, for sharing part of your day with us. And we'll look forward to seeing you at the opera. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.